Well, we apologize for starting the program this morning a little behind schedule due to technical issues. But we already have with us in the studio our first guest, Wale Edon, former Commissioner of Finance in Lagos State, 1999 to 2003, um, a knowledgeable man with a background in merchant uh, uh, banking, international finance, public finance as well. And he's also the chairman of the Board of Trustees on the Ogunic Cleanup in Nigeria. This morning, he will be taking on a number of issues, topical issues, issues in which he has been involved, financial, political, and also economic. Welcome to The Morning Show, Mr. Wale Edon. Well, Lovely well, to well, have you well, here. Good morning, sir. Well, Good morning. Uh, first question. Thank you. I mean, in, in 2015, your name was uh, mentioned as a potential ministerial nominee in Nigeria. But somehow, at the end of the day, your name didn't show up in, on that list. Uh, the Senate has just completed a screening of uh, ministerial nominees for 2019 to 2023 under the Buhari uh, administration. Again, you know, your name, there was a lot of speculation about you making the, uh, likely to make the ministerial list. Again, your name didn't show up. So you are the uh, perpetual ministerial nominee whose name never showed up, even if President Buhari in 2016 made you the chairman of the Board of Trustees of IREP, which is the body uh, to take a look at the, to implement the uh, Ogoni cleanup. Yes. Now, I mean, why, why is that the case? I mean, uh, well, the, does it bother you? And what do you think of the list that has eventually made it? It doesn't bother me in the least. And you know, Ruben, is, one is very honored, very flattered to have had one's name mentioned, not once, not twice, but politics being what it is, and the fact that the president has the prerogative and responsibility to decide and choose his team, um, I'm happy with um, whatever decision has been made. And um, I think there are more ways to contribute than being in the cabinet. And so I'm happy to support, to contribute any ideas uh, and thoughts that I have that can move the country forward. So no problems at all. In a country of 200 million people, it is by the grace of God that you emerge as one of only 43 cabinet members. And um, talking of the cabinet, I think what we can say this time is that we have a cabinet. We have it three months earlier than we had it last time. Uh, there are people who perhaps have different opinions about um, the different personalities that have been, um, uh, that, have, that have emerged, but they have been nominated they have been screened behind the scenes uh, uh, for security and so forth, and they have been screened by the Senate. And um, at the end of the day, we do have a cabinet, and uh, I think um, what you can say about them is that they're all Nigerians. We can't uh, say that uh, anybody is more patriotic than the other. And so it is time now, just as uh, when the Super Eagles uh, a team sheet is announced. You might think it will be should or shouldn't be played, Musa should or shouldn't be played, but once that team is announced, it is our responsibility to get behind the team and support it and help it to succeed. That's really my view. Absolutely. And uh, you're also the chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Ogoni Cleanup, which has finally commenced years after a flag off by the Vice President. What took so long? And what do you say to certain criticisms that have been made for instance, by Governor Wiki, who just said it's an exercise to attain political mileage. There have been criticisms of the contractors that have been selected to undertake the exercise, that they don't meet the standard required, that many of them don't have the experience, they were not incorporated, they don't have the necessary five-year minimum experience, they're not even in the relevant field. Some of them were incorporated as poultry farmers, for instance, and retail, all of a sudden have been awarded these contracts. What do you say to those criticisms? Well, I think the first thing to admit is that the pace of progress in terms of the physical cleanup is disappointing. We'd expected by now that we could talk about uh, the al amount of uh, land area that had been remediated and was on its way back to being turned into farmland, the water that had been cleaned up, and even the health of the communities that had been screened and was being restored, as well as their livelihoods. That has not happened. It is a cause of concern. The Ogoni Trust Fund uh, is one aspect of the uh, um, cleanup project. There's the financial, which is the money, 
uh, and that's the trust fund which I am uh, honored to be chairman of. On the other hand, there's the, the governing council is in charge of the physical cleanup, the identification of the areas to be cleaned, the dimensioning of them, and um, the letting out of the contracts. And um, whilst it is one team, and at the end of the day, it is one result that matters, I, I, would, I can understand Governor Wiki's frustration and um, all our frustrations that that cleanup has not gone, um, has not gone further than it has. And I think it needs to be re-examined as to why that there is this delay. And um, it needs to be put right and quickly too. Can you tell us about the... Sorry, sorry go for it. Can you, tell us, can you just clarify about the Ogoni Trust Fund? Because you just said there are two separate issues. Yes. So what's the status with the Ogoni Trust Fund? Well, the status with the Ogoni Trust Fund, I'm happy to say, is that um, the mandate from the president was that we should put in place a world-class structure for managing the funds onboarding the funds and even attracting new funds uh, to, for the cleanup of, of Ogoni land and perhaps later for other areas. And we've done that. We have a world-class escrow account. We have um, um, funds, that idle funds being managed by, um, uh, by, by various international banks. And um, the prospect of Nigerian banks being included in that is there because there are Nigerian banks that have offshore uh, offices and so forth. Um, we have in place the technical advisor ready to go in and, and measure whatever work that has been done to make sure that there's value for money. We have our legal advisor in place. We have the fund administrator. And um, in, in, in sum, I can say that we have a world-class structure for the Ogoni Trust Fund. And um, as far as the mandate that it has been given, it has fulfilled it to the letter. And what measures are also being taken to ensure that non-oil economic activity can also return to the people of Ogoni land? That also is part of the physical side of the cleanup. And um, uh, there is, is you're, you're, you're really addressing the return of the livelihoods, the restoration of the livelihoods of the people. And there are various training uh, schemes, empowerment schemes going on. And... Um, that is also strictly on the remit of the governing council. And is there ways to track the progress of these schemes? The, the, what we need to get from them is their quarterly or periodic reports. As far as the trust fund is concerned, what we do in terms to, in order to make sure we have value for money, when funds are, are given out, before a new set of money is released, we check that money that has been given has been, has been properly spent but effectively, we haven't had the opportunity to do that. All that's happened is that some takeoff funds have been spent um, on, on preparation. But as for the actual cleanup, we've got nothing to measure so far. That is the truth of the matter. And um, it's well worth drawing attention to. Well, in 2016, Shell, I mean, major player in the Ogoni uh, crisis, insisted on being included on the uh, board of the uh, trust fund. And some NGOs came forward at the exclusion uh, of Shell uh, could prove to be a, a problem in terms of the objectives of the, uh, of the remediation uh, committee and also the uh, trust fund. Has this been a problem in any way? And is Shell in any way involved? They're involved. They're on the governing council and they're on the, represented on the um, board of trustees of the, of the trust fund. So they're involved in both sides, in both governance structures. Um, because, of course, they are the leaders of the joint venture. They're the operator of the joint venture that um, is uh, operating in, that was operating in Ogoni land, and the joint venture that has, is contributing to the cleanup. But that joint venture is 60% or 55% owned by the Nigerian government, so the, the vast majority of the money that goes into the cleanup is actually from Nigerian government. Well, I know you are basically a technocrat. You are not a politician. Um, so I, I assume that being a technocrat, you can offer independent opinion on what has been happening in Nigeria since... Uh, President Buhari assumed office for a second term. Do you think we have the right momentum, or you think that uh, um, President Buhari is going too slow, uh, or do you think that you know the delay? There was still, well, still a delay with the appointment of ministers. You know that this could have far-reaching implications for the economy, for the for the interest of investors, the, the you know, and economic performance. 
Well, the first thing is that I'm involved in politics. I'm a member of the party. I go to the party meetings. I play oh, so you uh, leadership the role. Of a politician. Um, I think we, we all need to be involved. This is not the time for people who feel that they can contribute in any way, who are concerned to stand on the sidelines and be pointing fingers or accusing. As far as uh, the economy is concerned, I think um, it's very worrisome because if you, if you really look at, um, despite all the uh, assurances and despite all the good intentions, what has been delivered um, and uh, in the last three, four years, and coming to the fourth year now, what has been delivered really is an economic performance that is way below par. Even by the government's own, own measures, the economic recovery and growth plan is meant to deliver on average 3.8% per annum between 2017 and 2020. They delivered 1.6%. And why that is critical is that population growth Compound annual population growth is 2.3, 2.4, That means that over this period, if you want to put it in blunt terms, poverty has been delivered. And if you deliver poverty, there will be insecurity. There will be stresses and strains in the, in, in the social fabric of the society. And so um, we have a new cabinet. A third of the people have been returned. There are new uh, 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 people coming into government. But what matters more than anything else is the mandate that they are given. In England, uh, Boris has given them a mandate. All his cabinet are people who believe in Brexit, his view of Brexit. In America, um, Donald Trump, his cabinet, although they've all been falling like flies, but so, so maybe um, there's less buy-in to his, uh, his, his way of doing things. But you either get behind uh, uh, the program of the leader or you leave. But most importantly, the leader has to state a vision. And the vision that Nigerians need now... Well, Mr. Edwin, we'll take a short break and then we'll come back to you. I like the fact that you are very honest, very forthright about your assessment of the Buhari administration so far. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Still with us in the studio in Lagos, is Wale Edun, former Commissioner of Finance, Lagos State, a public finance uh, expert, and chairman of Chapel Hill Deham Group, an investment bank in uh, Nigeria. Before we went on break, Mr. Edun, you were talking about leadership vision, the mandate for ministers. What kind of mandate should we expect going forward now that uh, President Buhari has his ministers? Well, we hope for it is a mandate to grow the economy. And, um, you know, we had some indication or some, some prospect that that might actually be the case, if you, or, or some indication of the direction we would like to go in, pointed by none other than um, Honorable Minister Fashola. We don't know which ministry he's going to get now, but in his uh, presentation uh, at the screening at the, uh, at the Senate, he did talk of a 10 trillion uh, financing program. Infrastructure bond. Well, uh, finance, he, he's, a, he's more a lawyer than a, a finance person, so um, he did not elaborate that much on it. But the fact that he um, was, was, had in mind that type of quantum, that's what APC um, promised in his manifesto, a huge infrastructure development program that will, debate, will be the basis of galvanizing the economy and achieving growth, uh, relatively high rates of growth. We need double-digit growth in order to move out of poverty, in order to keep our youngsters who are leaving by the droves because of lack of opportunity, because of lack of growth of the economy. So I think we're looking for a bold economic vision. And I subscribe to the view of um, various economists that liquidity is the key, that we need to replace the dollars that have been lost to this economy as a result of the huge fall or the or significant fall in oil revenue. Well, because a lot has been made of the contribution of the diaspora in this regard. How would you advise the government to really maximize 
because it's pretty untapped. Everybody only looks to our oil revenue. So the impact of the diaspora, the input of the diaspora is not really being addressed. And I appreciate your philosophical approach to what Dr. Abati said about you being the bridesmaid and not the bride <laughs> quite yet. But what would you also make of the criticisms that were made of, well, we have to look to the past as a best indicator of future behavior. If so far a whole term has passed of the Buhari administration and they have delivered poverty, what really are the odds that a huge change is going to happen now? The criticism was made of CBN in the first term of Godwin Emefele's um, tenure that he had to straddle both monetary and fiscal policy because a vacuum existed. The reports then, when you were the bridesmaid in, as a contender, was that it was hoped that you would be given that portfolio of Minister for Finance. What would you do differently? What would you advise ought to be done at this point? Well, uh, first of all, in terms of diaspora, um, you're absolutely right. Financial flows have become even more important than physical flows. There is uh, low interest rates around the world. Um, America is just lower days again. And that means that money will be seeking higher returns. So there's a huge amount of money to be obtained, including diaspora funds. And we need to tap more into Nigerians abroad. We have a lot of Nigerians abroad earning well who, will, who believe in their country and would, would take the opportunity to invest. So part of the 10 trillion can come from the diaspora. Why not? Mm. Even a significant part of it as to... Uh, the, the, the role of um, the CBN and having to try and um, um, move the economy on the, on the fiscal side as well as the fact that, um, that he's really in charge of monetary policy, but with his ability to deny and uh, control foreign exchange, he can, he's trying to move companies to produce locally instead of importing, using foreign exchange as the bait. Overall, I think the, the main job of the governor of central bank is to control inflation, and he's doing that. He's bringing inflation down. If you bring inflation down, you get stability. If you have stability uh, um, you, uh, in the exchange rate, you, that allows dollars to come in and naira to come in. If people see a stable naira and relatively high um, interest rates, they will bring their money back from wherever it is and put it in the domestic system. If the banks have more long-term money, then they can finance investment. But to, to, in very brief terms, we are trying to reduce poverty. In order to reduce poverty, we have to have, uh, 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 um, people have to have jobs. In order for people to have jobs, you, you have to grow the economy. To grow the economy, you have to increase productivity. For increasing productivity, you need investment. And that investment, it cannot come from government's coffers because they don't have the revenue. It cannot come from government borrowing because they don't really have that much now. It has to come from private investment. Mm. And so we need to open up the economy to private investment, providing liquidity. And I'll just say this. Um, I said that uh, uh, Winston Fashola is not a finance man, so it's not his job to be creative and to think of a way. He's put a figure of 10 trillion. It's for the financial markets and the uh, 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 financial practitioners, practitioners to go and figure out a way of attracting 10 trillion. And part of the way is by de-risking de investment, guaranteeing people who invest, give them guarantees on their debt. They bring their equity, they add the local equity, and they, they have to borrow funds. Well, those funds that they borrow, um, if it's de-risked, the lenders are more willing to lend, and they... Um, get access to the funding and liquidity they need to move the economy. So it is that simple trajectory in a nutshell. Okay. Investment, investment, investment is what this economy needs now. But there's several concerns around the economy anyway. Like, let's say we take our Nigerian Treasury bills rates at the moment. That's a double digits, right? So there's not really an incentive for banks to want to lend to SMEs or other businesses, which then limits and hinders our economic growth. They'd rather lend that money to the government, who can take it at double digits. And that is something that's of effect. So how do we overcome hurdles like this that also exist in our economy that are bringing down the economy because smaller businesses are struggling to get the money that they need to actually start growing? and thrive? It's partly because, uh, the, the, partly the, part of the reason why the banks want to put their money in treasury bills is obviously because the, the, the risk the is risk lower. Is low. Yeah. 
but also because they don't have the they don't have that real liquidity. They don't have people leaving money with them for one, two, three years. It's all 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. So uh, if you ask them to take that money and, and invest and, and give it to somebody for a project, then they have a massive gap because in 90 days you ask for your money back and then um, they don't have it because they've lent it to someone for two, three years. So it's liquidity, long-term liquidity uh, um, is the answer. And it's that long-term liquidity that will give um, investments. And to you are just so right. Diaspora money is a critical part. But for now, it's money from anywhere. Foreign exchange from anywhere, we can get it. Naira from anybody that will put it down for a reasonable period of time. And, and it's not a silver bullet, but it will take us a long way. We have a good point about diaspora remittances, but we also know that in the face of a Brexit and the pound uh, sliding, uh, we could have you know, serious challenges in terms of what comes particularly from the United Kingdom, where we have so many Nigerians. But let me ask you uh, to spend, to comment a little further on MFL, which, yes. uh, you know, Tundu mentioned him. I mean, he has uh, presented a five-year transformation plan, and you, of course, know the highlights. I don't need to define that for you. And then at the last uh, Monetary Policy uh, Committee meeting, uh, consistently, that committee has insisted on maintaining the same framework for money, uh, monetary policy rate, for cash reserve ratio and liquidity yes. ratio. And the strongest argument is that, you know, uh, they want to gain more knowledge about headwinds and microeconomic uh, indicators. What's your assessment of the position, of that plan, five-year transformation plan, and uh, the consistent position of the Monetary uh, Policy Committee? Well, I commend his efforts. And as you've said, um, he is trying to help with the jump-starting the economy. But his primary job, which he's doing well, is to bring down inflation. It's like, a, you know, in boxing, if you, if, you go for the, if you go for the body, the head will fall, then you knock the guy out. So he needs, uh, the, the quicker he brings down inflation, the quicker the Treasury bill rate uh, um, will, will come down, and the more attractive other forms of, uh, uh, of deploying money will be. So. Um, I don't, it's not his job to do in, to industrial policy, um, to decide which sectors of the economy uh, um, uh, uh, should be championed. It, it is commendable what he's doing because he's, as you said, he's trying to fill that gap. But really, um, the gap is to be filled <coughs> well, we'll, we'll by investment. Well, we'll take a short break, Mr. Edwin, and then we'll come back. And when we return, uh, I would like you to comment further on not being the uh, central bank's governor uh, to worry about industrial policy, because he's into agriculture, he's into textiles. Most recently, he talked about milk, you know, and uh, some policy with regard to the importation of milk. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Still with us in the studio is Wale Eno, chairman, Chapel Hill Denham Group, an investment bank in Nigeria, and former commissioner for finance in Lagos State of Nigeria, 1999 to 2003. Before we went on break, you were commenting on the, uh, the transformation plan of the CBN governor, Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, Godwin MFL. And you were saying industrial policy is not really part of his remit, but he has done ANCOS uh, borrowers program, he has a program for agriculture, uh, he has foreign exchange restrictions for certain categories of uh, importation, particularly milk. Now, do you want to speak further on that? And what would you like the team, the new team coming in to handle fiscal policy? What would you like them to do differently? Well, first of all, I think, um, as I said before, it's commendable what the Governor of Central Bank is trying to do. And essentially, he's trying to uh, lower um, uh, the cost, the risk um, investment in certain sectors lower interest rates and provide funding, provide liquidity to certain sectors. He's done it in airlines, he's done it in energy, he's done it, of course, within agriculture and so on and so forth. But I, I would prefer a more holistic approach where the economic team, they look at the situation they have now. Really, they do not have liquidity, they do not have funds. However, they have assets. And um, I think it's very important 
that they look at the assets which have a revenue stream and they concession them out or they securitize them, they raise funds against a stream of income from investments um, such as LNG, from toll roads, from toll bridges. The Kaduna Abuja rail line is very successful by all accounts. The government did a good job building it and investing in that. They should now take their money and leave it to other people to manage and to operate on a concession basis, on any private uh, uh, um, sector basis that they're comfortable with, a long lease, partial privatization. Take their money, put it in housing, put it in education, put it in healthcare. Even in Lagos, the governor of Lagos has roads, uh, um, um, Lekki Toll Road or Lekki Bridge. It has revenue stream. Investment bankers will sit and look at, look at it and tell him that, take your money out. There are people that are willing to invest on, 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 on various terms. So that the government has to look at any way it can of bringing out liquidity so that it can have funds to invest in social sectors and it can allow the private sector. People are looking for investments. They're looking for good deals. And um, to the extent that we have assets, stadia. If you have a stadium or you have uh, a, look, uh, a property in prime areas, an example is what President Obasanjo did. The Lagos property, they were, uh, they were empty, derelict, half-occupied, government property in Ikoyi. He sold them all off and look at the investment that has followed. So that's an idea of what happens when you allow, um, you liberalize sectors and allow investment to come in. It creates jobs, it grows the economy, it reduces poverty. But I still have to go back to it. This, we hear the phrase liquidity or the word liquidity from experts such as yourself, but hardly a peep from the government. So really, are they looking in the wrong direction? All we do here is oh, economic growth, economic empowerment. Yes, but how? The president said in June, this is a lofty plan of lifting 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. But silence on strategy. It's a good question. It's a good question. And I think um, Nigerians have a right to say, we agree with that. We are on board. We are backing you on that. Tell us how. You know, I've just given... A, a, a sort of schematic as to how you can reduce poverty. You give people jobs because the economy is growing, because there's investment. And you've, you are part of, you've said part of the answer, the flows of funds. The economy used to have $140 billion in a year. That has gone down to 40, 50, 60 billion. That gap has to be closed and the money is available. Because elsewhere in the world, if you give the right conditions, you tell them Nigeria is open for business. Look at our energy, look at our road, look at our rail, look at our waterways. People will tell you that, well, toll roads, you can't just toll every road. You toll every railway line. Nobody goes for free on the railways, except maybe in Oshun State on the holidays. So on the waterways, every ferry you pay, so why can't you pay? Um, there will come a time when, you have, when you're up to your neck in it, where you've reached the limit, but we're nowhere near the limit of toll roads, people paying user charges. These are opportunities that people have, but you have to open up. And, you know, what you have said to do is that how, that how, the, the president has to, there's nothing wrong with the president saying to his cabinet, sit down and come out. They came out with an economic recovery and growth plan that said that the government was aiming to achieve 3.8%. It got 1.6. You can tell them, by the same way you did that, go and bring me an economic recovery and growth plan at 10% per annum and, uh, 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 and achievable as well. And then let's see if I will not take the political decisions to achieve it. One project the government recently came out with last week was the partnership, the new partnership with Siemens, yes. um, whereby the government said that we're looking to produce 23,000 megawatts, sorry, 11,000 megawatts of electricity by 2023, sorry. Now, this is a project that I would like you to comment on. What do you think about this partnership? And is it going to be opened up to Jenkos for more competitive rates for us, the consumers, as well? That, that is a specific, isolated 
project to produce more power. We need more power, so it's a, it's, it's a given. The problems in the power sector, I think, need all the stakeholders sitting down in a room and just agreeing that this is the way forward, rather than, you know, you have people at loggerheads, you have the regulator, NARC, at loggerheads with the discos, uh, the GENCOs too are not happy, and once the consumer is not happy, and, once you, and, and the only money you have in, in the electricity value chain is the tariff. When the, it's the tariff which pays the generator, the disco, and the transmitter. So um, clearly, that sector, it, I mean, more power is better. So if there's someone to produce 11,000 megawatts, that is a positive thing. But I think the problems in the, in the, in the energy sector require um, serious cooperation between all the actors to come out because right now um, there's no solution that we as Nigerians can buy into. Well, Mr. Edun, let's uh, soften the conversation a little. Uh, you mentioned boxing earlier on. Yes. And I know you are chairman of uh, an amateur boxing uh, organization. Why you? boxing? You don't seem to have my Tyson's muscles to well, me. Well, I was an amateur boxer, <laughs> but... Uh, oh, you were an yes, amateur, amateur boxer? I'm one at that. Really? Yes, national champion. <laughs> okay, what do we do to... So, you so, know, so, but the point there. The level of boxing in Nigeria. The real point there is that it's for the youth. It's, it's, it's something. It's like all sporting activity, gives young people that sense of belonging, that challenge, that opportunity to show what they can. Do. And the and and the and the pattern of of training, preparation, and the hygiene it gives you. You shower every time. You know, in the boxing, you know, after training. Uh, the, what it teaches you about your diet. You can't just eat anything if you're preparing. And of all things, boxing, you stand in the corner, opposite person, nobody else to help you, nobody to uh, 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 protect you except yourself. So it's a, it's, it's a very great um, uh, discipline. But the, but the important thing is that it's for the young people. We all have to do something for these young people. They're leaving the country in droves. So what have, can we do to prevent that? You have to give flight. them jobs. You have to occupy them. You have to. Luckily, we do have our bright spots. Look at what our entertainers are doing. Lion King, um, choreographed uh, the, uh, the, the music, I think was curated, you say, yeah. by Beyonce. It's all Nigerian artists. So we do have, we can hit the high spots. And really, um, these young people are looking to hear from the president that this is what we have for you. We have jobs, we have opportunity, we have a platform for you to express yourself in Nigeria. Yeah, it was given to us in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, but boxing is often overlooked. There's greater emphasis on football. How do we get the uh, balance to make yeah, sure that we're... the boxing... Uh, we, uh, we actually, it's an, we have an NGO that supports the amateur boxing in Lagos, Ogun, and, and, and will spread further afield. And um, it is coming up. When you look at the GoTV professional boxing night, it's all, um, virtually all, what I will say, from our academy. All the top boxers earning millions of naira um, each night that they box. They're from us, Fijabi, Otto, Agbaje, Ruan, Oladozu, all the top names. Maybe you, you don't delve into that area, but there are people listening who know. About, how much, uh, about professional boxing, they are all, and these are people who have not just benefited from the discipline of training through their teenage years, which are very difficult years, but they've excelled enough to make earn a living from it. You're completely right, because Anthony Joshua, the famed Anthony Joshua, did say that without boxing, his life would be completely different. He would have, you know, got into the wrong hands, as it were. So this is the importance of these sports and the work that you're doing. That's well, the key. I know you're also involved in the media. Um, yes. I don't know whether you are still the chairman of the board of the nation. I am. Yeah, so you've been involved in managing the uh, print media. Yes. Um, and a significant platform in the Nigerian space. Now, what are the challenges that you think the print media in Nigeria faces, you know, from your experience? Some people say, well, the biggest uh, threat is the threat of social media, and that the newspaper uh, is likely to die at some point. But as a newspaper manager, uh, what have you seen? What has been your experience? Well, uh, it's interesting. From the beginning, the, 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 the foray into, into the media 
was um, um, by our political God, uh, 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 fathers and mentors said that, look, it's important for democracy to have uh, to have to have as a to <laughs> have a um, to have a newspaper. So what he did was that he encouraged people to invest. Um, so he indirectly is the main supporter, but he encouraged others, got them to say, look, put money into this. In the same way, he's, he's encouraged people to come into politics. And so the newspaper itself, we're very, very glad it's now, uh, it's currently the newspaper of the year, has top uh, award-winning economy. So we're happy with and what has we happened there. Days, the newspaper <laughs> of record. <laughs> yeah, but, but, on this but, platform. But the point is that the, the, there is danger um, really from the... the, the, the inability to, to get newsprint at a reasonable price. So therefore, um, as you know, the economics of newspapers are such that the paper itself is uh, produced at a high, higher than the selling cost, so adverts and so forth have to make up for it. But um, in terms of social media, there are huge issues there, and that's why people are paying billions of dollars in fines for, for, for the mistakes they are making. But I think newspapers have to also move with the times and um, their electronic platforms, their social media platforms are going to be just as important as their papers. But, but, but there's still a role, I believe, in a democracy in particular for the print media. Absolutely. And then the print media also diversifying itself. You see a lot of international news um, agencies going out there and using different forms of media, from podcasts now, to how they can visualize their media yes. more to attract young people. Do you think Nigerian media is getting there, or do we still have a long way to go? Uh, I think definitely we have a long way to go, but um, everybody is focusing more and more on all those um, different dimensions of media that you've just mentioned. So. Um, it's opportunity. You know, one way to look at the fact that we do not, we're not up to scratch in certain areas is that it's all opportunity. Whether it's, is, um, whether it's hotel uh, management, whether it's catering, whether it's events, uh, um, whether it's uh, roads, all this, people outside, they see it as opportunity, but we have to open the door and let them into that uh, to take advantage of that opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Waliadu. If this was uh, a ministerial screening uh, uh, session, I'm sure you'll get a yes vote from all three of us. No, we will tell you, no, no he, he didn't buy a go. We, we, you know, we grade him. Thank, thank you very much.